now. Good morning, good afternoon for everyone in WA Queensland and NT. Hello, my name is Agatha and I am the Business Advisory Manager at Business Station. Thank you for attending our Mike O'Hagan webinar series. We at Business Station are proud to bring you this session as part of the Digital Solutions Australian Small Business Advisory Services funded by the OS industry. The team at Business Station have teamed up with Australia's Mr. Mini Movers, Mr. Mike O'Hagan, to bring you a series of four webinars. This is our second one. And within these webinars, we're going to help you learn how Mike um, has created this empire, essentially the recipe for success and what not to do if you want to win at the game of business. Mr. Michael Hagen is been there, still doing it kind of guy. With $200 and a youth, Mike grew a short distance furniture moving business into professionally managed business that turned over almost $30 million, employing about 500 people. That business is the well-known Mini Movers, and Mike was the founder and the driving force. Mike then became an expert in offshoring in the Philippines, helping over 500 businesses develop their own offshore teams. Today, he is the chair or chairs several boards, including another growing star, Shaw 360. All right, without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to Mr. Michael Hagen, and I'm going to spotlight him and remove myself. Go right ahead, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and I thank Business Station as, as for hosting me today uh, and also congratulate the attendees. Reaching out to, to learn is, is how we all get ahead. And, and, and certainly I, I am my experiences, but I'm also all the learning that I've done over the years as well. Last week, uh, I talked about mindset or, or focus, if you want to call it that, um, and how that's important because if you haven't got your, your focus in the right direction, you're not going to get there. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about actual growth strategies. And in fact, I'm going to build that around the mini mover story and the real things that happened in the growth. Um, so a lot of today is going to be very relevant for any service or anybody selling time. Understand that fundamentally, you can only sell two things. You can only sell product or time. And the service sector, right through the professions and, and all those things all sell time. A lot of what I talk about is very relevant to time. Um, and product, is, is, it's got some different strategies around it. So I'm not about selling time. If you're involved in selling time, a lot of what I'm going to share with you will, will work with you. I need you to also note that uh, many movers grew dramatically or very steadily and, uh, um, from 1987 right through to 2008. In 2003, we, we won the, the, Australian, uh, the Queensland section of this Australian Small Business Award, the Telstra Small Business of, of the Year. Um, but in 2008, I corporatized the company. I, I stepped out of the day-to-day -day running and brought in uh, a, a more professional management team to run it. Um, they unfortunately sailed straight into the, the GFC and the, the business tanked. It went down dramatically. Um, I stepped back in after a few years uh, and, uh, and leveled it off and, and flattened it out and put it back into profit. And, and uh, I actually stepped out of the company completely about 18 months ago. So I have nothing to do with mini movers at all anymore. And a lot of what I'm talking about today is re relative to the period from 1987 through to 2008. The strategies are the same. Things changed a bit after that is what I'm trying to say. And uh, so if you come in and say you used mini movers recently and that sort of thing didn't happen, well, that's fine because that, I was talking about a little bit long ago. I'm sharing from my experiences, okay? You can only really learn from the experiences, I believe. You can't learn out of a book. Um, so how did it start? Well, as I explained last year, I had, um, I had three shops. I was working 90 hours a week. I was looking for something else. Uh, and I was looking for opportunities and I was trying things and coming along. And one morning, one, a, a lady from a customer from one of my, my, my furniture stores rang me very early in the morning in a flap. And she knew me reasonably well. She was a very, very regular customer. She lived just up the road and I lived near, the, near, near my shop, one of the shops. And she said, um, Mr. Hagen, please, I need to move today and can somebody move me? And I said, wow, why, what's the rush? She said, well, I didn't have a rush actually. It was all planned. I'm, I'm selling my, my little apartment that I'm living in here and I'm bought an, a house three doors down the street 
I'm only moving three doors down the street. I had a removal company come out and they quoted me a price and I accepted that and all was well, except that they rang me early this morning and said they can't move me. And I'm settling this morning at 10 o'clock. I have to move. It was a big rush. And, you know, I, uh, I knew a lot about, a reasonable about the removal industry because I had furniture stores. I had two little trucks that were used for delivery, basically utes. And I thought about it and uh, I said, look, I, I can help you. I've got a ute and I've got a couple of a couple of my Kiwi mates were hanging around my house and needed something to do. And I said, look, I've got a, a ute here and a couple of my mates. How about I just send them up and they can move you? I said, they'll have to do it in a few trips, but you're only moving two doors up the road. It won't really matter. And she said, oh, good. Give me a price. I said, well, I can't give you a price. And this, I must admit, this is 40 years ago, so the numbers will be a bit very different today. I said, well, how about, how about we just charge you $30 an hour? And she said, oh, I don't know how that's going to work. And she really didn't want to do that. And I sort of got on my high horse and said, look, either take it or leave it. If you want to move, we can have somebody there in about an hour's time and we can start moving. It's $30 an hour. So that happened. I, I, she said yes. And I sent my friends down to move her. Uh, was, then I went off and had my usual busy, busy day and forgot all about what had happened in the morning. Got home that night and put my feet up. The phone rang and the lady was on the phone. And she went on and on and on about how this was the seventh time she'd moved in her life. Um, all the other experiences were horrible and bad. And the experience she had with my two mates and, and my little ute was amazing. She said over and over again, they did whatever we they asked. she asked them to do. She, they set up the fridge and they connected the washing machine. They did everything. They set everything up properly. They, they Nothing was damaged. They did a fantastic job. They told jokes all the way through the whole move, which turned it into a fun experience instead of a bad experience. And right at the end, she dropped the clanger on me. And she said, you know what? I said, this has only cost me, I think it was less than $200, $180 or something. And I'd been quoted over $1,000 for the move for the removal that turned me down that in the morning. So the interesting thing was I'd made a profit with what we'd charged and the removalists were charging a phenomenal amount of money more. Now I finished that call and over the next few days in my little brain, it was just ticking over. That's weird. How come I could do that and create such a happy customer and with such a low cost? So I started looking at the removal industry and I realized that they were, if you like, doing it wrong. Um, they were doing the same system for no matter where you moved in the world, other side of the world, other side of Australia, interstate, or two doors up in the same street, same, same system. They were sending a salesman out who cost a lot of money. He stayed in the house for quite a while and did a big list of everything you had to move. He went away. A couple of days later, back came a fixed price quotation. And and you um, and you, you either accepted or didn't accept it. They upsold you with insurance. Um, and they, they, they then told you that they had to pack because of insurance, et cetera, and it just got more expensive and more expensive. So um, that was the basis of mini movers starting. It was just, I did this move and I thought, wow, I managed to wow them at a lower price. Then I realized the industry was doing it around the wrong way. And back in those days, nobody was doing hourly rate local moving at all. Nobody had heard of such a thing. So on that basis, I simply started. I already had a ute, a two-way radio system, a couple of guys that were used to humping furniture because we had our, our furniture stores. It was all normal for us with the deliveries. And literally all I did, and I didn't even call it anything at the start, all I did was put some ads in the local Quest newspapers in those days, and the phone rang red hot, absolutely crazy. And I couldn't believe it. I discovered a better way of doing it, a way that was a lot cheaper but still profitable, and there seemed to be an awful lot of demand for it because when I dropped ads in the paper, the phone was ringing red hot. They were the components that I was gluing together in my head that said, there's an opportunity to go here. And that's kind of how come I went on and built a big moving business, yet I didn't know anything about moving furniture. In fact, I've never moved a stick of furniture. I don't even know how to do that. I did it because I came back at it from the business perspective, not from the tradesman's perspective. And I started, I started mini movers purely and absolutely to create a lifestyle for me. All right, totally, totally for creating a lifestyle for me. And and that's what it was all about. It was all about that. And and as I got into it, um, we started. We called it AT Carriers for I think about twelve months, maybe eighteen months. Then we um, 
then I decided to, I was looking at all the brand names around the place and looking at branding and I thought, oh, it needs a catchier name. And then I went off and got the market research that I mentioned last week, um, got the market research and I got really focused in on how big the market is and the sort of messages the market needed to be able to make it, make it all happen. So nowadays, it didn't take long. I'll come back to, I'll come to marketing later. I'm gonna talk about it as a subject, but I've got to tell you that those local newspapers all they did was create a lot of phone calls. They didn't create a lot of work. Uh, they were full of people that, um, that really wanted everything on the cheap. And they just drove us bad in. It took us probably a good year or two years to work out that whilst our advertising in those days was creating an awful lot of activity, it wasn't really coming to much and we had to find a different way to market it. And I'll talk about that later, but it started by the fact that I dropped those, 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 those um, adverts into the paper and the phone rang. And that just that blew me away. The um, the overall strategy to to build mini rivers was very clear in my in my um, my head. I had to develop processes. I had to systemize those processes. I needed to systemize the removal industry. I had to set the industry standards. I also understood that I I needed to ride the trend that was happening in the market. Now, back in 1987. Um, it was the mid 80s. The Chinese had just started manufacturing. Uh, at that stage, it was all gloom and doom for Australia because their manufacturing industry was coming under threat. Um, to me, that was just an opportunity because that was that was moving the human capital, the workers from factories into the service sector. And if you look back, you'll find that there was a massive trend from the mid 80s well into the mid 90s in Australia where there was a huge big upswing in, in the service sector, uh, and particularly the home service, anything, any service into the home, uh, carpet cleaning, pest control, uh, moving, that's the actual industry we're in. We're not, not in the transport industry, we're in the home service sector, and that grew dramatically from mid 80s to the 90s, driven by the fact that the Chinese were flooding the market with cheap manufacturing. It was putting the Australian manufacturers under, under duress the smart Australian manufacturers moved to China and started selling all around the world. The, 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 the ones that weren't so smart just sat there and slowly went dump, went uh, broke, which was sadly a, a, not, a few of them, but not a lot. All the, uh, all the others all changed their model, but it created this whole service sector. The other thing that happened during that period, and it's kind of still happening now, and if you're into market trends, you should be very aware of this. There was a huge, there's been over the years, last 30 or 40 years, there's been a massive, great, steady increase in what we call disposable income. The incomes in Australia, contrary to popular opinion, have been going up and up and up. And we have gone well past, in Australia, we've gone well past the need to put a roof over our head and the need to clothe ourselves and to have fundamental food. We've gone way past that. We're now spending money buying services into our house that our grandparents would never have thought of buying, that we can afford you know, pest control, carpet cleaning, moving and all those sort of things. Um, and of course, it caused the travel industry to take off because we all wanted experiences. We started traveling all around the world. Now that's caused by, through the, throughout the Western world, but particularly in Australia, a massive increase in disposable income. So you have these market trends. Now, the reason I'm explaining this to you, I need you to understand that for me to fire mini movers, I had inside me a fairly good picture of the trends in the market, and what my market was doing around the product that I was developing, the service that I was developing. I really understood how they're all working together. And therefore, I, later on, when I got the market research and I understood the right messages to put out there and how to carve a niche into the market. Yes, Mini Movers was innovative. It developed and it invented almost and developed hourly rate local moving. But at the end of the day, I came into a pretty busy market a very established market. There's nothing new about moving furniture. And I came into it and inside that market, I managed to develop a new innovative product that literally made my, my business grow. So that was the fundamentals of it. But what happened then was that I, I'd started studying McDonald's. I started reading books about McDonald's and I understood the principles of systemizing and duplicating. And I, I was getting that in my mind. I'm going, okay, so that's how we do it. We systemize and duplicate it. We take a service, a local short distance moving service. And for everything we do, we develop a process around it. Then we systemize that process. 
then we develop into a training system, then we bring people in, preferably, and later on, and I'll talk about this in, the, in my last uh, um, webinar, the fourth webinar, when I talk about people, preferably low, inexperienced people, not low skill people, but inexperienced people, because I, I want no influence from the outside or from the industry, from the moving industry. I want to do it our way and our ways to a set system. So we build a set system, we brought in inexperienced people, we train those inexperienced people to do it our way. And we also did it in a way that guaranteed or, or tried to guarantee, we came very, very close to it, getting full continuity. In other words, every job done exactly the same way to the same standards. And that was really important because they were the strings that I was pulling as the owner of the business. All right, and it was really interesting because my competitors, or not, they actually, they're not actually my competitors, they just thought they were. The removal industry was watching me and they really couldn't understand what I was doing. I was in a completely different planet from where they were. They were focused on trucks and fuel and all sorts of stuff. And I'm, I'm focused on systems and processes and people. How do I get people to behave? How do I get them there? And I didn't go forward by building a very structured plan and executing it. I did it completely the opposite. I had no plan. There was no structured plan. We knew where we were going. We knew the planet that we were floating in. We knew the world we were floating in and what was going on around it. But what we did, and, and, and this created absolute chaos, and, and it happened by accident because plain common sense. I conceived ideas. I then worked out how to test the idea in an affordable way. I measured the results. What worked, I did more. What didn't work, I stopped or changed. So I didn't sit down and build a whole plan and cost it all out and then go and execute it. And haven't even done that in our, in our latest business. And we'll talk about that in the next, next webinar. But uh, what we did was basically, we proved that something was gonna work and then we did it a lot. But before we committed anything to it, anything of any significance, we made sure we knew that it was gonna work. And that was all the way through the business. It happened with in, in buying trucks. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. It happened with, it happened with um, uh, equipment. It happened with uh, people, uh, employees. It happened with marketing. All those things were constantly under change, constantly being challenged, kind of had a bit of a theory. We do 80% the same, 20% we're experimenting to see if there's a better way of doing it. And constantly, constantly and ever improving. So if you are doing that and you're ever improving your business, when these big changes come along, which has just occurred in the last 12 months, they're only business changes, they're just normal changes and thing. They've been happening like this for many, many time, years. They, you're able to follow those changes a bit more because you're not sitting there trying to execute a structured plan that is inevitably heading towards oblivion because of some change in the market. Just plain common, common sense. There was no set, set path, there was no set plan just an idea of the world we're floating in and where we wanted to get. And the reason we were doing it was from my perspective, I was about lifestyle. I needed an awful big cash, weekly cash income to fuel my lifestyle and the lifestyle of my family. My passion was not about moving furniture. My passion, and it still is the same today, is about building a money-making machine. I am so focused on building money-making machines. I love it. And that's where I'm at. So it's not my product I love, it's the business I love. And that's what drives me and makes me want to do this. Interesting, as we develop mini movers, common sense said to me, oh, if I've got my goal and, you know, none of my staff were going to share the goal of the owner wanting to have a lifestyle. Nobody was going to share that goal. So I figured out mini movers needs a goal. So I gave mini movers a goal and, and, and it was spread around inside the company and everybody and in all suppliers to the company that knew about us and knew what we were up to, they all knew about it. And that goal was, goal was and it came from my background of where I've been studying. One day, Mini Movers will be a bigger brand name worldwide than McDonald's, right? Now that paints a picture, that gives a picture of where we were heading and what we were trying to achieve. We were building a brand, we were building a set process we were rolling it out. We were systemizing and duplicating it. We were breaking our little industry, our little niche down in the industry, short distance local moving. And we were, we were systemizing it and growing it that way using the same principles as the franchise system. But, but we, didn't, we weren't using franchising. We didn't do that. There were reasons for that. Um, too slow to start up and a whole lot of other things. I'll answer them in the questions if you want to know more about that. Um, so 
as that's the mini movers goal that was the company goal but then i worked out that you know what all the people working in mini movers and mini movers is about people it's a service it's completely it's about people from the moment you ring them or contact them and how you're treated on the phone and how everything's discussed about down to the operators when they arrive to move you and doing the job through you to afterwards if anything goes wrong and we want to fix it up it's all about people we're totally about people we're not selling product we're selling time and time is people and therefore we need them to be focused on doing a fantastic job because that's how we were driving our market so the people goal the goal for the people inside mini movers was to create aesthetically happy customers for they tell others giving us tomorrow's work now that was all through the company. It didn't matter whether you're the internal accountant, it didn't matter who you were, your job was to create aesthetically happy customers because they created tomorrow's work. And I pushed that all through it over and over again. So it was totally boring to those that heard it a hundred times, but that's how it was pushed over and over again. And when people started with mini movers, there was a video of me on the, there talking about the goal and the passion and where we're going and what we needed to do and told a story about the first customer and how happy she was. And I set the scene that that's what we're gonna do. Me, what was I doing? I'm putting together a structured solution using the power of people. Um, I needed everybody rowing in one direction. I needed them doing it my way. They, all, they the boys on the trucks, the operators, they also needed to, to, the freedom to be able to make decisions for the customers too. So while we had set structured systems, we had in, built into the system and they still have that today, a lot of uh, ability for them to make a decision on the job to fix something, cure something or, 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 or do something about it. Um, so we have systemized it, systemized all the processes, but there's still a, uh, the need that we need to create statically happy customers. So you need to deal with whatever is there on the day. Um, so we developed it, we invented a better way in an existing market. I've had a lot of experience with starting quite a few businesses. And I've got to tell you that the businesses that have invented something completely new have really, really struggled and been very, very difficult to establish. My businesses that have entered uh, an existing market, um, but done it differently with a different, different um, process a better process than what's in there have really taken off. And I think there's something in that, especially if you're out there looking for new, new opportunities moment, it's very easy in this technology way, the way technology is nowadays and some of the changes to invent this wonderful new thing, but by gee, it's hard to flog something that's new. It's much easier to go into an existing industry and just do it better and get a better name for yourself. Um, people were interesting. So with the people, I, I actually started um, with my two trucks and the phones are ringing and my two trucks very, very, very quickly got really, really busy. And I wanted to, to go out and lease a new truck. I'd gone off and found out how much trucks were to lease. I'd done my math. I'd done my homework on the back of a cigarette packet, how much, how much it's got to lease, how many hours a month that would work, et cetera, et cetera. And I worked it all out. But my partner in life at the time, um, was very, very opposed to borrowing money and didn't want to get involved in, 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 in leasing equipment. So what had happened is I'd been nosing around all the local truck yards and they all knew me or knew of me and I'd been around. And one of the truck yards one day, this is back in, this has been about 89 now, roughly around about 1989. The market was very flat. Businesses were going broke. Um, things were getting a bit tough and there was there was a, quite a lot of young guys out there that had gone off and leased brand new trucks subcontracted to some business of some sort that business had fallen over and they ended up with the truck and the lease and if you lease a truck for the first 12 months 18 months maybe almost two years you actually owe more than what the actual truck's worth so it's a, it's very difficult for you to get out if you lose the work you've got the lease payment you've got no income and you can't sell it to get rid of the debt. And I was um, in my little dilemma and there was a knock on the door and there was a young fella that had been sent up to me from a, the local truck yard because he had this, he wanted to try and sell the truck, but he owed more than what it was worth. So that the, the truck yard couldn't help him. And they thought maybe I could do something with him. So I sat down and listened to his story 
his company he's working for had fallen over. He had a beautiful brand new truck out the thing, not a, no marks on it. Brand new, it was the dream truck, the perfect truck I needed. And I looked at it and I thought, okay, his problem is he's got this payments, but no income. My problem is I just need a truck and I don't want to borrow money. And suddenly I just, I don't know how, sometimes it happens to you in life, instantly you have these snaps. And when you look back, you think, well, that was clever. I don't know where it came from. I just turned around to him and said, look, mate, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hire the truck off you for so much an hour. Now, I already knew from my homework what the lease was. I knew exactly how much an hour the lease was. I knew how much the fuel was going to be. I actually knew all those numbers. So I was able to pluck a number which was fair for both of us. It, uh, it fixed my problem and it cured his issue. And he said, oh, I don't know how that's going to work. I'll see you what. If you can. And I just turned around and I said, look, it can start working tomorrow and I'll pay you weekly. Now, he was behind with his payments. He had the bank making funny noises. And so he took it. And then we developed this idea of, of what we call truck owners. And we were then hunting for people that were in financial difficulty because they'd leased vehicles and didn't have any work for them. We didn't take the people. We didn't want them because we wanted to control the labor. We wanted to make sure that the guys in the trucks were doing a good job. All we did was hire their trucks. And I built many moves up to about 15 or 18 trucks simply by hiring them of people who were getting into financial trouble. So I mean, and that was three or four, two, two or three, four years maybe. Um, Mini movers grew dramatically. Uh, we had these truck owners, so I didn't have any commitment or any leases. I borrowed no money whatsoever. The profit was going up. Everything was going up. Everything was firing along. We were controlling the labor. We were doing a pretty good job, um, ever improving, getting it better and better. And we'd go, and I'd never borrowed anything. And then the um, one of the uh, truck owners decided to go out and become a competitor. He got in bed with uh, somebody else that was close to our industry. And um, that sort of upset me a bit. So I walked into the bank one day and I had, I think, three years financials, clean profit. And I said, there's a little, little issue though. I don't own the trucks. These guys here own the trucks. This is how much I pay these guys. If I lease those trucks off you, the bank, this is how much I'd pay you, and this is how much more profit I'd make. And the bank just looked, took one look at it and said, go buy the trucks. So we went out and we purchased a complete fleet of brand spanking new trucks, which we managed to sign right in that funny cartoon stuff and everything else. And suddenly we appeared. We'd been operating for four years. We'd been growing well. We were already quite sizable, but we suddenly appeared in the market. And things. so... The moral of that story, I don't think you need money, honestly. And you certainly don't, I don't think you need to borrow money. I think you just need to be creative in what you're doing and get around it. I was giving away profit by borrowing the trucks, by hiring the trucks. I got that. I knew that. I was very aware of it, but I still had profit for me and everybody was happy, right? And then I was able to, and then I, so I tested that the truck business was going to work. I've proven beyond doubt that it was going to grow, that the market was there. I've proven that it was profitable before I went and borrowed the money and leased those trucks. And later on, we got out of leasing. We managed to loop our way out of it. And uh, today, I don't believe they lease any of them. I don't think they, I think they own them all now. Um, certainly 2007, we owned practically all of the vehicles in those days as well. If you don't need money, thing. And we, so the next thing that became a bit of an issue was, was, was the whole recruiting process um, and training and everything else. So we did try subcontracting for a little while. And we discovered that if you hire people who want to be in business for themselves and you teach them a business model that's pretty easy to copy, that you know, after a while they work out, why am I giving you away my profit? I can go out and do it myself. So we sort of created our own competitors for quite a while. Most of them are still friends with me today. And, and you know, I've got best of luck to them. If you get an idea and make a business out of it, go for it. No problems at all. I've got no issue with that. But it was a problem. And also, we it's very hard to control the workmanship when they own a truck and working very hard. So recruiting became an issue. So we developed a system where we had to, where today, or we're not now, we developed a system where we went to the market with lots of ads. We brought in 200 people. Uh, 200, sorry, we have 200 people a week applying for a job. We only need two. And the idea was that 200 gives us a chance to filter that down and get the two that we need. 
and we have a very structured system around recruiting coming in. We play them videos showing them seven different lift, lifting me methods. We watch what they're doing. We're assessing them. Um, our interest in them is, do they live in the area? Are they trainable? Are they physically capable? Can they hold a conversation? If we can tick those boxes, they've got a job. And I'll, I'll deal with a lot more of that in my last webinar, how we did that and how we got those people through the numbers we churned through and the actual process we did. And how later on, I'll talk about how we automated it as well uh, with, with computerization to do it as well. Marketing, lots of pa local papers at the start, it didn't work. Um, lots of calls with little work. The next thing that worked for us and worked very, very well was Yellow Pages. And over the years, I, I, I increased Yellow Pages and of course we spread around Australia into, into Western Australia, Adelaide, um, Melbourne and, and Sydney. And I ended up with multiple full page ads in every, in, in every um, made in Yellow Pages in every major city. Um, in 2007, we spent $1.2 million in the Yellow Pages book. And in the next webinar, when I talk about the downturn and how we handled it, I'm going to talk about what happened because part of the downturn with GFC, uh, of course, um, uh, smartphones came in around about the same time and the whole marketing thing changed. Uh, and we had to then move on to, uh, well, then we had a, a web and, and domains and all that stuff. We're playing that game. And then we left on and, we, and, and then we moved into lead gen and how we do lead gen. And I'll cover that in the next, uh, the next, um, webinar as well. Lead gen was all about um, nowadays they hunt down customers, they find who the potential customers, they contact them and pitch it. And that's what's working very, very well for them now. Doing it in a big way though, in a very, very big way. And I think that they were at one stage um, processing 3,800 leads a day, um, five days a week. So it was a pretty major operation they had going. Um, but what really worked and worked the most was doing an outstanding job, having a product to suit the market and then delivering it in a wow way and then leaving them with a memorable name. So people remembered you when you're at a barbecue and told other people about you. You know, 80% of our work was coming from use before and refers. 80% of our work was not ringing any competitor. They were simply ringing us. They'd been told, everybody had told them use mini movers. They rang us and they booked us. We were able to charge more than the others, and we had a hell of a lot more work than the others. But it was all driven by the fact that we were doing a really, really, really good job in generating that word of mouth because I was in the background pushing them through. We had a program and still have a program called Friends of Mini Movers, Friends of Our Business. We're referring, these are people that have the potential to refer us. Real estate agents who were given boxes of cherries every Christmas, uh, minty trucks that'll trucks, mini movers, cardboard trucks that we put on front counters full of minties and a whole lot of other things. The key is to try and get people to talk about you. Uh, and paid advertising to this very day, and I swear this would be 90% of businesses, the best, most effective paid advertising you can do is sign writing on your vehicles. If you do it once, if you do it in a way that it really stands out and is really noticed, it will work for you beautifully. I was really good at PR. I attend lots of meetings. I'd go to three or four breakfast meetings a week. Um, nowadays, of course, they're webinars or um, meetup groups or whatever. I, I joined lots of I, I joined lots of uh, not-for-profit programs and helped helped the government do a whole lot of different stuff. Uh, and everybody, everyone there I went near, everywhere I went, I branded myself as Mr. Mini Movers. I knew that. We also had a guarantee that if we damage, we'll fix it. We used that to turn bad experiences into good experiences. Everything's totally focused on creating a raving fan and creating somebody because at the end of the day, word of mouth is how I grow the business. Processes and systems. We um, systemized it. I remember in the first year we were, we were in business, um, the first year in business, uh, I'd got my very first computer. It was a 40 megabyte um, 286, I think it was called. I'd actually borrowed a little bit of money to buy it. And um, um, and I had it there in the office and I was working on it and, and it had a 20 megabyte hard drive and you couldn't possibly fill it, said the salesman. It was just an amazing thing. And I don't think it was WordPerfect. I think it was before that. I think it was a thing called Word. 
um, or something similar. And I was in this spread, I was in this uh, word doc, document, the word processing document. And what I'd done is I'd worked out there were 20, 28 different ways, 28 different things we do on every job. You know, you come in in the morning and you get this, then you get the job, then you go out to sit in the truck, in the truck you do this, then you do that, then you arrive at the job, you park out front, you both go in together, you introduce yourself, you explain this. There are 28 things that we do exactly the same way on every job, slightly modified because of computerization over time, but still there. That became what we call the set system. And I just numbered them, one to 28. Later on, we put columns beside them and turn them into the training system. And the training system is a sheet of paper with one person telling the next person how to do it. The industry took two years to train somebody. There's this whole thing about training and government funds and everything else. I managed to get it down to four to six weeks. And we were producing a way, way better person quality service as a result of how we were doing it. 50%, 80% focus on wowing the customers. The rest of the time focus on actually our system processes, how to do the paperwork, and of course, how to actually move furniture. Counting money. I started with a small accountant. Uh, we outgrew him. We outgrew him around about the time that uh, we started paying payroll tax. And we missed the, the first bit going in where we were late getting in because our accountant didn't understand when it applied. Uh, we picked that up. We changed accountants at that stage. I asked my bank manager. He gave me a really, really good accountant. That guy's still around today. He knows who he is. There's two of them, actually. Um, they introduced me to management accounting or cost accounting. P&Ls and balance sheets are completely use, useless. What they call compliance accounting, the accounting that you have to do for the government, are completely useless for running a business or running the decision making in the day to day of a business. Um, I had this big thing about balance sheets. Uh, they, you know, when you've got when you've got a hundred trucks, and those trucks are worth about a hundred thousand dollars each. That's ten million dollars, and they're going down at a certain rate in the market. And somebody, an accountant, comes along and he applies a formula that the taxation office used to do tax depreciated. Then they use the tax depreciated balance sheet to to tell you what your return on your investment is. It's all wrong. It's completely wrong. So we developed uh, two, two balance sheets. We had a management balance sheet and a tax balance sheet, totally different. Management balance sheet, we would ring up and get a quick valuation on everything, put it in and then feed it. And we were watching the real numbers as well as what the tax were doing with the tax things. So we learned tricks like that. They produced um, um, weekly reports and then monthly reports, which were not columns, they were, they were numbers uh, and they were numbers by unit. How many hours we sold, what our wages per sold hour were, what our cost, truck costs were per hour sold, all as numbers, as a percentage of income and as a cost per, per unit that we sold. They put them in these reports and they, then they put traffic lights in. Green was good, yellow was a need to look at it, and red was being bad, we need to deal with it. Okay, and that's how my reports used to come in because basically I'm computer, I'm, I'm um, financially illiterate. I've never really learned how to count money properly. I just know how to, how to make it and generate it. I don't know how to count it very well from a government point of view. I don't understand that at all. Haven't really got involved in it. I don't need to get involved in it. I've always paid somebody else to do that part of my business. In summary, total focus on building a machine. We had a strategy and direction, but we didn't work to a set structured business plan. We didn't have the plan and then execute it. The corporates that came in behind me tried that and it failed for them when the market was changing. And I'll talk about that next week. I'm going to talk about the downturn next week and how we reacted and what we did to turn the company around. Um, we went with 80% um, the same and 20% experimental all the time with a, with a complete focus on ever improving. Everything's up for grabs. We can always improve. Nothing's set in stone. Whilst we have set structured processes, I'm prepared to change them if you can prove that there's a better way of doing it. Profit first, cash flow second, your people, then the customer in that order. If you think that your people and your customers are more important than profit, try it without profit. If you think, try it without cash flow. So profit first, cash flow second, then your people, and then the customer. Love them all, work them around, but I know what order they've got to go in, right? 
there's a lot of stuff out there around people and being more important. Customers, the most important thing in your business. I, yes, they are, and no, they're not. Profit is also very, very important. Try, try without it. All right, so that's it at this stage. We'll talk a little about next at the end of the seminar. We'll, we'll talk more about what's coming up in the future from me um, on, on these little talks about how we did it and, and what we did. So there we are. We'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Mike. That was just absolutely brilliant. Now I'd like to invite uh, the two advisors here today, Dante and Tracy, to turn on their video. And I know Tracy, you're in a remote area, so if you can't turn on your radio, so, oh, there you go. Hi, Tracy. That looks good. Uh, first of all, of course, Mike, fantastic delivery as always. Uh, but we're going to start with introduction to the um, two advisors here on today. Dante, if you're going to start, um, tell us who you are and what you do and what sort of um, offering you do within the ASBEST program. Hi there, and Dante and James uh, from Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory, based out of Darwin, which is the picture you can see in the background. Currently at my parents' place on the Gold Coast. It's not as pretty a background behind me, so I've hidden that away. Uh, I don't think you need to see my mum's collection of dolls and teddy bears. Uh, I work primarily with Facebook Australia as a digital marketing associate and a lead trainer, both for their global programs for training businesses and their local program as a community trainer as well. So I'm very, very well versed across the the, um, the social media sphere work in a lot of uh, a lot of uh, website programs as well WordPress Wix Squarespace Weebly Shopify WooCommerce I know I've probably worked with it at some stage. Um, Agatha likes to call it my rap sheet. So I've got a very long rap sheet of different skills I've got and done a lot of certification. But what it comes down to is that I'm all about um, finding small businesses, um, probably like yours that are struggling a little bit, might be a bit nervous about the digital world and really just need someone to demystify it and make it make sense along that way. So if I can help you out, please do reach out and um, I'll hand back to you, Agatha. Thanks, Dante. Yeah, you got a long rap sheet. And if you guys check her, check him out on our um, link that I just shared in chat, you can see that rap sheet. Uh, and Tracy, hello from New South Wales, somewhere in a whoop whoop, are you? <laughs> Not whoop whoop, northern New South Wales. So okay. Downtown, beautiful downtown Ballina, right near Byron Bay. Uh. Uh, so, hi folks, my name is Tracy Sheen. I'm known as The Digital Guide. So I'm based in Queensland and I work with businesses like Dante from WANT and all across Queensland. So I've got 30 years experience in um, marketing and sales, particularly around small business technology. So I was there as part of the pilot team for the SMS technology. I was there for the launch of the iPhone. I've kind of been there for the major milestones all the way through Australian small business technology. I love strategy. So I love working with businesses to help them get their strategy right to begin with. Where are you going? Who are you talking to? How are we gonna get you there? Let's pick some platforms and let's get down to business. I'm very practical. I'm also a trained copywriter, so I spent my time in radio and TV learning the art of copywriting. So I really love just getting those foundational pieces right to make sure that we can springboard into where it is that you need to be. Um, anything from podcasting to clubhouse, copywriting to strategy, hit me up and I'm happy to have a chat and then hand you across to Dante when you need the specifics of how to get Facebook to work properly for you. Uh, thanks, Tracy. That's fantastic intro. And if anyone would like to see uh, Tracy's uh, profile, I also shared it on the chat. All right, we'll get to it. Um, do ask your questions, guys, in the Q&A section at the bottom. We'll, uh, we'll answer everything live. Now, this is a very good question here from um, one of the attendees. Mike, I'm actually asking this question as well. Um, now, you don't like debt. So that's, that's fantastic. But um, in this day and age, can you grow a business like yours that it, what you did uh, without a debt? How do you do it if, if it is day and age, you reckon? So you're muted, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, there's a lot of myths in business and a lot of it's caused by the fact that there's a massive difference between corporate business and SMEs or smaller businesses. SMEs or smaller businesses work on tacit knowledge. They, 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 they run along, they have a tendency to, to bootstrap, uh, to start with little no money and work off profit and pull that profit back into the business and generate growth. And 
if you don't believe me, go back and look at the origin, or origins of Apple and microsourcing. They all bootstrapped at the start. Um, unfortunately, when we start teaching business, we've taken the, the corporate model. And the corporate model is very clear that you take money and you invest it and you get a return on the investment. And that's not the way 99.9% .9 of small businesses work. <laughs> they don't do that. They have a skill and they get out and plug the skill and get money. It's different. So, um, look, if you come to me and say, Mike, I've got a business plan here. I need to borrow money. I'm going to build a chemical factory. I need $100 million to build a chemical factory. I think what I'm going to produce, I can sell. I'm going, well, you're crazy. You, that's just out of your own depth and you're taking risk. Um, which brings you to another thing. I don't think businesses are risky. I think working for, working for a business is risky. I really do. Um, I think if you own a business and your business has got good fundamentals, it's got a good market, and it's not overborrowed, it's sitting there and it's prepared to change when, to turn, think, turn, when things come along, then you probably are at less risk than, than, than an employee is in the modern thing. So I don't, think, I, I don't believe that the vast majority of businesses, particularly in the service sector, don't forget I'm very much about the service sector, although you can do it with product as well. And I know plenty of people that have bootstrapped products uh, and got them going by just funding from within. But uh, it should be taught as a subject in Australian business bootstrapping. If you don't know what it is, look it up and start studying it. It's funding from within, all right? And that's the way to do it. Less, it's safer, it's cleaner. I love it. Lean, absolutely. Dante and Tracy, maybe Dante first. What, do you want to have a, a sort of a, a bit of a comment on that? I know you've seen a lot of businesses coming through, and uh, this is a, a common problem. Done a little bit of this, a little bit of this myself. Like actually, um, the first business I grew didn't particularly go well. I shut it down before it became a major disaster. Um, I think um, where we're trying to get in trouble with the, the whole debt trap is that we get very attached to our business. And we treat our business like it's a child or like it's a puppy. And we think it's all so cute and I want to grow it and I want to nurture it. And I want to make it this beautiful thing. Sometimes a business is just a business. It's just a method of making money like a job is. So you pick it up, you grow it, then you pass it on, you sell it off to someone else. And then when I, and I went the, the last two businesses I created did pretty well, I sold them off. They funded the next thing I was doing. So I avoided debt by basically building something up, selling it, using that money to build the next thing build that up sell it and now i'm in the middle of doing that with three individual businesses now that's pretty much how you do it but in the very early days you're just going to have to understand that you need to generate that money so it's either through clients coming into the business or get a full-time job learn how to work from 5 p.m to 9 p.m every day or well, like gary vaynerchuk says from what does he say from yeah. about 7 p.m to 2 a.m or something he goes yeah. into a bit a bit crazy there but you know it may seem hard it may seem impossible that's what business is. It is hard. It is often impossible. And it takes above average commitment to get even the most average results. So that's a decision you need to make. If, you're, if your business requires a lot of debt and this is your first time out, you're probably getting into the wrong kind of business. I love it. You know, it's spot on. I know. So uh, Tracy, do you want to add a couple of things on that? Uh, look, I grew up the child of self-employed parents. So when I was five, I knew I wanted to be my own boss one day. I just didn't know what that looked like. Um, I've tried a bunch of businesses. I failed at a bunch. Some have been good, some have been bad. Um, I think one to, to Mike's point there, I think we all need to understand the theory of sunk cost, you know, know when to get out, know when to cut your losses um, and know when to, you know, double down and go hard. So I totally agree that, you know, the risky thing now is to be an employee. You know, we only need to look at COVID last year and see what that looked like for a lot of employees. I would much rather be in control of my own destiny. And, you know, the, the people on today's webinar that have been joining us, I know you folks are all the same. That's why we're sitting around, you know, hanging out with smart people and listening to people that have been there and done that. Because we want to be in charge of our own destiny. Agreed. Yeah, no, that's good. It, you take the first step. Now, uh, next question is, how did you manage the culture in Mini Movers, Mike, as it grew so quickly? And what did you do to avoid issue with, issues with so many people joining the business? Um, the quick answer is I created the culture and I, I, I encouraged the culture. Um, we, we only employed inexperienced people. We refused to employ anybody who'd been in the industry before. So we took 
inexperienced people who had a really burning desire for a job and then we taught them exactly how to do everything. So they only did it our way and no other way. And we built a culture around that. Um, next week I'll talk about, and we'll talk about the, the famous breakfast that we do for all the staff. They still do that this very day. Everywhere in the world, would you believe, because many moves has offices overseas, but everywhere in the world, they have a breakfast in the morning. It's, it's part of the culture, it's part of what we are. And so I understand, look, I did it naturally. I, I, when I was a young fella, I spent 10 years hitchhiking around Australia. I worked for some really bad, bad people. I worked for some really, really good ones. And when I became an employer, I created a workplace that I wanted to come to every day. And then my people also shared that and want to come to it too. A very that. appropriate workplace. And it got killed off. I got to tell you, when we corporatized the business, the culture really took a dive. It took a turn for the worse. Um, it went from a, a fun, happy, highly politically incorrect place, and that's what killed it off, um, into this sterile place with rules and everything else and just changed the way the whole thing worked. Um, they, to this day, they're still struggling to get the old culture back. But in my day, it was because I created it. Simple. All right, good answer, fantastic. Dante and Tracy, maybe start with Tracy. Um, you want to add into that at all? culture how do you create it um so i'm i'm a big fan of the apple model i live inside the apple ecosystem and one of the things that steve jobs talks about well talked about is you never want to be the smartest person in the room so one of the things for me is you know i hire on personality and you know if they are a good fit for the business in terms of culture as Mike was talking about, and then everything else can be trained. Um, but you need to make sure that they're going to fit, you know. So, and that culture is, to me, it's just like, you know, how, how are you going to treat your friends and family? You spend a lot of time at work. You don't want to be creating something so rigid that, you know, you don't enjoy being there. So it needs to have a bit of fun and flexibility, but it needs to reflect your own personality as well. That's just my take. Absolutely. I love it. Absolutely. I love I'm, I, I'm in the Apple ecosystem as well. That, uh, so we're in the same place, Tracy. How about you, Dante? I've had a pretty um, up and down with culture myself. So it's been one of those things where I start out and have very I, strong ideals. I took my lessons from the Googles and the Facebooks of the world mm -hmm. where they've got these very, very strong senses of culture within their organization and slippery dips and, and free food and cafeterias. And of course, as a small business, can't quite replicate that kind of thing. But you can add in things such as, um, for instance, like I, I was like Mike, I like to, to take people who didn't have a preconception about what digital marketing building websites was like and they come in with very fresh ideas and very fresh eyes and so you could train them in the structure of what you wanted but they're coming in with a very different point of view that you wouldn't get if you just hired someone from another agency i was once told well doesn't that really you know hobble the employment market and i said well i said i'm not here to be propping up the australian economy i'm here to be making myself money and to be passing my business to the next person so who i hire and how i hire them is completely up to what serves my needs as a business owner not as someone who's going to contribute to the employment market of the northern territory or north queensland so i i really like mike's mentality and i call it the aldi mentality um aldi is very much like that they don't like hiring people from other supermarkets because they don't want to have to unlearn all those yes. bad habits they learned elsewhere in order to be successful within a new structure of course, no, very good, very good feedback. Now, uh, there is one question that actually uh, offline is got to do with the growth strategy when you're extremely busy, um, but then you haven't got the help. And then it's kind of like, I guess, balancing that help uh, and quoting, specifically quoting. So I, I assume this person is a trainee um, in terms of when do you actually make the time while delivering the business also quoting time? Uh, they can't keep up essentially. And then, you know, what is the balance? Because how many um, they couldn't figure out in terms of how many quotes uh, can convert into sales and you know, I guess how to balance that. Mike, do you wanna share about mini movers and how you did it to begin with? Yeah, listen, I, I've got a, a, a list of how I built mini movers from the start. And I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants to message me through LinkedIn or Facebook or anything else. And, and I'll send it out to you. It's a, it's a thing. Thank but you. basically, it says keep your day job. Um, 
start it on the side, grow it up. When it overtakes your day job, then you get rid of your day job and you carry on. It goes through a whole lot of steps. Now, if you're doing that and you do it properly, you will never, ever, ever work in your business. I have never moved a load of furniture. I don't actually know how to move furniture. I love it. I had a business where I was working 90 hours a week, earning the same amount of money as my staff who are working 40 hours a week. That's stupid. But unfortunately, it's quite common. And one of my mantras in life, read my LinkedIn profile, read it very carefully. One of my mantras in life is just try and stop, get, get everybody out of this business trap. It's a trap. Don't go there. We're in it for our lifestyles, guys. So stop working in it. So two things, I've never worked in the business, so I've never had the problem of actually not having enough hours because I've been working in the business. I've always, always hired somebody else to do the stuff like bookkeeping and filling out government forms. And somebody once told me that a BAS form is really important. I've never seen a BAS form. No idea. What do I need to know that for? That's rubbish. What I do know is how to get a customer, how to hire somebody, how to train them up so they service the customer and how to make money. Fantastic. Very, very and good. It's more important than counting it. That's for sure. So, <laughs> So the, the thing is with the tradies, unfortunately, if you read the e myth, and he needs to read the e myth to get it, um, it, it, it the e myth is very, very clear that he's a, he's a tradie and he's trapped in that thinking and it's going to take a lot to get out of it. I, I know I was an electrician as a, a young fella, and I know I know the whole mantra around how you thought as an electrician. Um, you know, I and understand what I've told you, that what I've just explained. I came into the removal industry without, had, without never being in the removal industry with an idea that I could do it totally different than how everybody else did. When I started hiring people to be in the industry, they started telling me what I was doing wrong. So we very quickly learned to get out of that trap. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Um, sorry, Tracy, do you want to add into that at all? How do you find the time? I know every one of us is very busy. Uh, look, how, how do you top Mike? Um, it Tech technology lean on technology you know there are some great tools out there that as soon as you've spoken to somebody you can just jump into your phone or your ipad or whatever you're using and you can knock out a quote there and then so it should take no more than you know a minute or two post that conversation that that quote has been sent you're going to spend a little bit of time setting it up but that time invested in understanding the tools that you can leverage your time from will give you back that time, you know, tenfold. I actually have a book coming out about that, so you might want to grab that along with the e -myth. Sounds good. Let's do it. And Dante? I allocate an hourly rate to myself, even if it's an imaginary one. And I just go, you know what? I'm worth X amount of money per hour for me to work in it. And then I look at it and go, well, so how much is it going to cost me to get someone else to do my bass? Well, it's way more expensive for me to do it than what it is for them to do it. How much is it going to cost me to do this content work on this website? Well, the person who's really good at it and really efficient at it, they're really cheap compared to me. So that's where it all comes down to. If you don't value your time, you don't actually pay yourself a wage or somehow value your time at a certain amount of money, then you'll never actually know how much you're actually losing every time you do that drudgery kind of work that's all over the place. That, um, that, that doesn't pay you any money and it's just filling time. Otherwise, you'll, you, you don't become a Mike O'Hagan. You just become a, uh, a Sally too busy because you're just too busy doing everything else in the world but actually growing your business. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan Tai. Um, all right. I am a bit mindful with time, of course. Uh, I just want to thank everyone who has asked those questions do come back next week same time same day because there'll be more of mike o'hagan and his success recipe and we'll ask we'll answer more questions then uh, of course this session was brought was brought to you by business station through the ask mass digital solutions we are delivering small business advisory through webinars workshops and one-on-one -on -one. if you want to book one-on-one -on -one with dante or tracy do just uh, you know hit up our website businessstation.com.au or askmas.com.au and then you can find these two lovely advisors now i just want the last word michael hagan mike uh what is the takeaway today just uh you know so well, everyone will do just one thing today what is it you know i uh if there's one thing that i i do is i take action i actually do things 
okay? And, and I think that's a, a critical factor. I think if you want to be successful, you've got to take action, you've got to do things. I mean, we may be different in our approach. You talk to different entrepreneurs, we've all got different ideas. But one thing that we do as entrepreneurs is we, we took action, we actually did it. So do it, get in there and start doing things, okay? Change things, do things. Whatever works, do more. If it doesn't work, don't do it anymore. Very simple, leave that with you. Absolutely fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Dante. Thanks, Tracy. And I'll see you next week. Have a great one. Bye.